Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program entitled The Clinician's Eye, Learning to See in the Art Museum. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and we're pleased to bring you these uh, weekly programs throughout each semester. Over the past decade, several leading U.S. medical schools have developed courses, often required courses, that combine visual art analysis and clinical observation skills. Medical students venture from the clinic to the art gallery, where they're challenged by gallery educators and medical professors alike to observe and to articulate what they see in the works of art before them. Such courses aim to cultivate and deepen students' visual literacy, their verbal facility, their tolerance for ambiguity, and their openness to different cultural perspectives, with the expectation that more finely tuned visual observation, critical thinking, and communication skills will help participants to become better doctors. Working last year with a faculty student task force at the UVA School of Medicine, Freeland Museum of Art academic curator Jordan Love created the Clinician's Eye, an interactive workshop that aims to um, refine apprentice clinicians' skills through training in visual analysis. We piloted this module last winter and spring with small groups of senior medical students and with some residents. In August, an abbreviated version of the Clinician's Eye was part of Cells to Society, the course with which the class of 2017, 160 students strong, began their medical studies. This Medical Center Hour gives all of you an opportunity to experience this workshop in the art of observation. Unfortunately, PowerPoint images in the auditorium will have to do. We're not in the art gallery, although we encourage you to visit the Fraley Museum and its exhibits, as indeed a group of medical and nursing students uh, studying compassionate care of the dying did just this past Monday evening. Nor are we able to equip you with premium art supplies. It's printer paper and golf pencils. Um, but you're in expert hands uh, with Jordan Love as your preceptor. And she'll soon have you exercising your eyes, your critical facilities, your imagination, uh, your hands, and your words. Following the workshop, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education, Dr. Don Innes, who is also a professor of pathology, um, and a member of our Clinician's Eye Task Force, and not incidentally, a longtime art collector. Uh, Dr. Innes will make some brief remarks about connecting visual art and medicine. So um, enjoy this hour, um, which will be illuminating uh, for all of us, I'm sure. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, so uh, we're going to take a look, we're going to exercise our right brain, and we're going to take a look at um, a couple of, well, we're going to take a look at one video, and then we're going to listen to NPR, a brief NPR clip talking about that video. Now, I want to see a show of hands. How many people have heard about the exercise, the cognitive psychology exercise, where people pass, people in different colored shirts pass a basketball around to one another? Raise your hands. Okay, so a good number of people. Now, for those who haven't, this is for you. So if you know this test, don't say anything. Okay? Because I'm always interested in the few people who haven't, because it is kind of widely known, the few people who haven't, it's always interesting to see how they go through the test. So it's very simple. It's several different people will be passing a basketball between them. Some people are wearing white shirts and some people are wearing black shirts. And I want you to count how many times the people with white shirts pass a basketball back and forth to each other. They're going to be moving around, so you should pay, pay careful attention. And then when the video is over, I'm going to ask you what number you came up with, okay? This is a test of selective attention. 
Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? How many passes? Yell it out, loud and proud. The correct what? answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? Did you see the gorilla? <laughs> this video is from Search by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll hold off on the NPR clip for the time being. Um, so, be honest. How many people did not see the gorilla? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. For those people who already knew what can happen, how many of you didn't see it when you first saw this video? Okay. Yeah. 50% um, of the population does not see the gorilla. Um, the other 50%, maybe some of them are lying, but we can't really tell. Um, so yeah, this is what we call selective attention. It means that when I give you a specific task, you get so narrowly focused on that task that something extraneous could happen and you will not notice it. Which is good to know about human nature because if you're a physician and you're looking for something specific, and something else shows up. You want to be have enough attention to pick up on that thing you didn't expect to be there, right? So um, this is something that we also study in our history too, because it's our job to notice details in everything we see. Um, so this is it's great to have art history not only overlap with medicine but also cognitive psychology, because there are whole groups of people who are actually studying selective attention deficit. So, because this is just a natural part of human nature that we do get so focused on something this specific that we miss something as obvious as a gorilla walking across the street right in front of our eyes and not, and not actually see it. So, if you're aware that this happens, that's huge. Now, one thing that once I, um, Harvard psychologist is doing is studying whether radiologists who are trained to you know analyze images all day and find specific elements in them whether they are better at this test than the average population so NPR did a brief clip on that to find out how they did See the world. Here's NPR's Elise Spiegel. This story about how you see the world begins with a group of people who are expert at looking. The professional searchers known as radiologists. If you watch radiologists do what they do, he, I was absolutely convinced that they're like superhuman. This is a Harvard researcher named Trafton Drew. And about three years ago, he started watching radiologists do their work. For hours, he would stand in their dark viewing rooms in awe that they could so easily see in the images before them things that to him were invisible. These tiny little nodules that I can't even see when people point to them. You know, they're just in a different world in terms of finding this very, very hard to find thing. But radiologists do sometimes fail to see important things. And Drew, who studies visual attention at Harvard, wanted to understand more. Now, because of his work in this field, Drew was naturally familiar with one of the most famous studies in the field of attention research, the Invisible Gorilla Experiment. This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri. That's psychologist Daniel Simons introducing the video that's used in the study. Before the video begins, viewers are told that they will see two groups of kids passing a basketball back and forth. And they're told to do one thing and one thing only. 
Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Drew says this is actually quite hard because the players are constantly moving around. You have to really think about, you know, you're counting in your head, one, two, three, four, five. And as you're counting that, a gorilla wanders onto the screen, looks straight ahead, beats his chest, and walks off the screen. 19, 20. Then the viewer is asked, Did you see the gorilla? Sounds ridiculous, right? There's a gorilla on the screen, of course you're going to see it. But 50% of people miss the gorilla. This is because when you ask someone to perform a challenging task, without realizing it, their attention narrows and can block out other things, even huge, hairy gorillas that appear directly in front of them. Which brings us back to the expert lookers, the radiologists. Traft and Drew wondered if somehow being so well trained in searching would make them immune to missing large hairy gorillas. You might expect that because they're experts, they would notice if something unusual was there. And so he took a picture of a gorilla. It's not an actual gorilla. It's a man in a gorilla suit, but he's shaking his fist angrily. And superimposed that image on a series of the slides that radiologists typically look at when they're searching for cancer. Then he asked a bunch of radiologists to review the slides for cancerous nodules. He wanted to see if they would notice a gorilla the size of a matchbook glaring angrily at them from inside the slide, but they didn't. 83% of the radiologists did not see the gorilla. Now, it wasn't that the eyes of the radiologists didn't happen to fall on the large angry gorilla. The problem was in the way their brains had framed what they were doing. They were looking for cancer, not gorillas. And so... They look right at it, but because they're not looking for a gorilla, Anyway, because they're not looking for a gorilla, they don't actually see the image of the gorilla. Now, I actually dug into PubMed and I actually found the slide of the gorilla that the radiologists were, were looking at. So let's take a look here. Let's see. Oh, you're going to bring me back? Okay. All right, so here's the slide they were looking at. You already know there's a gorilla there. Can you point it out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a uh, right here. There he is. So what they found was that even when radiologists were looking directly at it, they still didn't see it because they were looking for something different. So this tells you that radiologists are just actually when they had they uh, what they didn't say in, NP, in the NPR clip is they also had a group of non-radiologists look at the same slide and zero percent of them saw the gorilla. So the fact that so the fact that eight that fourteen percent of radiologists actually saw it was better than the regular population, which was zero. Um, so the the only issue is their sample size was twenty two radiologists. So. I think four of them saw the, saw the gorilla, something like that. Um, so anyway, it would be interesting to take a larger number of radiologists in a larger control group uh, and find out whether there was uh, any larger difference with that sample size. Um, but it is interesting that even with people whose job it is to be uh, to, to have a form of visual analysis, that even they uh, miss something like this gorilla, which is a little bit hidden, but once you see it, it kind of stands out as being kind of obvious. Um, when I showed the basketball selection attention test to the museum's advisory board, a lot of whom have worked at places like Christie's, Sotheby's, they're major collectors and donors, none of them saw the gorilla. <laughs> so anyway, don't feel bad about, you know, if you didn't see it because these are people who pride themselves on um, their own visual analysis skills. So, so it's, not, it's, not that, um, it's not that uncommon. But it's good to know that this happens, especially if you're in the field where uh, finding something like illness based off visual diagnosis is such an important part of your everyday uh, activities. Um, because if you know that you might miss something, it might cause you to slow down your looking, or to take a double look, or to consult with somebody else who has also looked. Because imagine if those radiologists had instead been working in teams, and one person in the team had seen a gorilla. Then that would have covered everybody's bases. So it's not just about visual analysis and seeing, it's also about teamwork and communication. I noticed on the glass walkway overpass over the road, um, 
that there are all those um, inspirational words like creativity um, along that they're painted along the glass, and one of the only one of them deals with collaboration. And I think, but I think the collaboration and communication, but those are the two most important things you're going to do. Especially when you think about this tendency of ours to not see something that could be in plain sight. So it's important to know. Um, the other thing too is what we see is not only based on our attention, but based on our culture. Because um, other uh, cognitive psychologists have done studies where They've shown images to um, a group of uh, American and European viewers and a group of Chinese and Singapore viewers to see how they process imagery and whether there's differences. And they found that they did several different uh, whoops here. They did several different uh, groups of images. One where the, the object in the foreground stays the same and the background stays the same, and one where the foreground object stays the same, but they change the background, and then the opposite. And then a fourth group where both the foreground object and the background change. And what they found is that Americans and Europeans were much more, registered much more um, attention to the foreground object. They tended to notice more when the foreground object changed than when the background changed. Now, for the Chinese and Singapore group, they noticed more when the background changed. So the culture that you grow up in tends to affect how you see, because uh, if you're used to or trained to look at something as part of a larger whole, as it seems to be the tendency in uh, East Asian cultures, you're more likely to register background changes. Whereas in Western society, we've come through a whole uh, tradition of imagery where we're told or kind of unconsciously trained to, trained to focus on an object in the foreground. This comes straight out of the Renaissance. Thank you, Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> because they stopped paying attention to background. There was about a 200 year period of painting where there was little or no background. It was all about the portrait. It was all about the object in, or the still life. Background didn't matter. There was no uh, um, other than, I mean, until landscape came back into fashion in uh, the, especially in, uh, in the Netherlands, it was all about the foreground object for at least 200 years. And so, and it's still very much that way. If you think about the portraits that you see, maybe hanging up in the medical school, portraits of people, the background is almost nondescript. Uh, the, the picture of Sandy Weil in Weil Cornell Medical Center, it's got him and his wife and no background. She's sitting on a chair, that's it. So there's never any focus of context. They're never, the, your portraits are never put in the person's uh, inside the medical school with students all around them. That's just not the Western tradition of imagery. Whereas it is the tradition of imagery in Chinese painting where you have a single uh, artist or a uh, little scholar in a vast Chinese landscape with trails and houses and that sort of thing. So it's very much been the tradition in Chinese and Japanese painting for at least 500 years to have and more to have a whole landscape, and if you show people, they're tiny. If you show larger people, they're always within a room full of objects and other people. It's all about context. So what you see also depends on where you grow up. So it helps if you're collaborating that you have people of many different backgrounds because you're more likely to catch the missed things because some people will be looking at some things and some people will be focused on others. And that's why collaboration is so important. You know? All right. Um, so one, there have been studies on how visual analysis in art museums aids in uh, visual analysis in medicine. 
Yale did a study. They found that there was a 10% improvement in the diagnostic abilities of dermatology students. Um, and so these, these are all studies that can be seen on PubMed. Um, UT San Antonio did a workshop at an art museum. Uh, for, and usually these workshops are about two and a half hours, sometimes once, sometimes twice. And they find that the most benefit comes out of a workshop of about two and a, at least two and a half hours. And there's no steep um, appreciation after that. And there's not a huge amount of benefit less than that. So it seems like that two and a half hours is really when it starts to sink in with people when they're practicing visual analysis with, within a group. Um, and some of the, the um, benefits that they've observed are appreciation from multiple perspectives. They start to see how, when you work in groups, how some people see some details and some people see others. Um, they also learn not to jump to conclusions. When you slow down your looking, you start to see more details and you're less likely because if you rush to conclusion at the beginning, you could miss out on details that would send you in another direction. For example, on Monday when I had a group of students in and I showed them a picture of, from the 1730s of a woman dying within a room and there were a bunch of people around her. The students immediately wanted to, to conclude exactly what was going on in the painting. I'm like, no, 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 don't jump to conclusions. Just tell me what you see. They wanted to say, oh, I see a dying woman. Her husband's there. I'm like, how do you know it's her husband? Just tell me what you see. What you see. Do you see a woman? Do you see a man? Do you see a child? Do you see a dog? Do you see a, you know, just tell me what you see. When you have to slow it down, you're less likely to jump to conclusions and miss an aspect of it that would send you in a different direction. So this is important to slow it down. Um, the other reason that it helps, that art history helps out and museum analysis helps out with medicine is the fact that the, the process of analysis is very similar. When, I'm, when I was doing my dissertation, this is exactly what I was doing. I was making observations of the artwork. I was studying all different people's interpretations of that same artwork. Um, I was sorting through ambiguous evidence because my specialty is medieval and there's nothing more ambiguous than medieval art that no one has left a letter. I meant to do this, you know. <laughs> and then I collaborated with other scholars and then uh, came to my consensus based off of that collaboration. So it's the same process as in the medical field because when you get down to it, it's really detective work any sort of detective work. I mean, if you're in Homeland Security, you're probably doing the same thing. If you're in, on NYPD, you're probably doing the same thing. And so that's why there are actually um, art historians running visual analysis workshops for the FBI and for NYPD and for nursing schools and because it's the processing so very similar. And there are no life or death consequences Although art historians would tell you different, I'm sure. <laughs> it, when I was doing my dissertation, it felt like a life or death consequence. But, um, uh, but you know, the one great thing about practicing it in art is that there, there's less at stake. There's less at stake. Um, there's rarely a right or wrong because sometimes we don't know what the artist intended. We can come to a consensus about probably what the intention was, but there's not no there's a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity in art. Just as there can be ambiguity in medicine, sometimes you have multiple things going on with one patient, and there's no one big answer to the whole thing. Um, also, when students spend 25 minutes looking at a single image, uh, normally it's only about 27 seconds in a museum. So when you slow it down, you do tend to see more than you would if you were just visiting the museum on your own. <laughs> a workshop forces you to do that. Um, and it's the same thing. A lot of doctors are complaining that they have less and less time with each patient. And there is a consequence to that. Just as there's a consequence to, to spending less time with an artwork, there's a consequence to spending less time with a patient because you have less time to notice those details. Or to pick up on behaviors, pick up on um, 
things that would give you a clue as to what may be going on, of uh, visual cues. Um, and actually, um, I don't know where uh, the um, uh, UT at San Antonio came up with 27 seconds because I had heard another statistic that the average museum visitor looks at an object for six seconds. So, it's, well, the point is it's not that long. So there's only so much you're going to get when you're just an average museum visitor. So just as you get more out of artwork when you force yourself to slow it down, not to jump to conclusions, it's the same thing in medicine. There are benefits to slowing down the looking and to not to jump to conclusions and try to diagnose right away. Okay, now you don't have to be an art historian. Good news! <laughs> you don't have to be an art historian to get good at visual analysis. Because we are bombarded with images every day. Now, and mainly through logos and advertising. So what are, what are some of the things that pop out at you when you look at some of these logos? I'm just going to ask you. We're practicing now. We're in it. I'm going to come up Donahue style with a microphone. So, so hmm? Why do you think that is? Why do you think red is so is used so often? Well, I think red is one of your favorite colors. If you ask people if you favorite color, it's so say red. Right. Why do you think people's favorite color? Mm -hmm. It's an attention getter. It's an attention getter. Yeah. It's more often to be noticed than really any other color. Um, that's why if you have a red car, your car insurance is going to be more expensive because it's the most stolen <laughs> car, <laughs> not the type, it's the color. Red cars are stolen more often than not red colors, or not red cars. So, yeah, so, and they, of course, advertisers know this. They've spent millions of dollars researching this. They know what color is going to get your attention. Now, what other things do you notice? If I'm going to market to a young, a young guy, what am I going to put on my car logo? Hmm? Power. Yeah, powerful. Right. But what's powerful? Hmm? Yeah, the bull. The fire. Right, right. I mean, am I going to sell Lamborghini by putting the bunny on there? <laughs> Right, so, so whatever you pick also has to be geared toward the psychology of your audience, too. The other thing that advertisers have a tendency to do is flash images for a very short amount of time. If you ever watch a 30-second commercial, you'll notice they don't have an image on there longer than about 1.5 seconds. This is not an accident. The less time you spend looking, the more likely you are to buy. This is this has actually been published. They've actually read, you know, published this. That the shorter amount of time that you spend looking at something, the more likely you are to buy. Because they're counting on your subconscious. They're not selling to you. They're selling to your subconscious, which is you know a, a little more emotional driven. So if you're feeling bad that day, you're more likely to buy chocolate. You know, that kind of thing. They're counting on that. They don't want you to stop and think about it because the longer you take to think about a purchase, the less likely you are to make it. So that's why we have to get you with colors, and that's why we have to get you with um, images like the bull, um, so that we can talk to your subconscious, your subconscious that wants to be powerful and that wants to be masculine and that wants to, you know, Buy that truck, you know, to express that about ourselves. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, is colors are no accident, as we talked about with red. Um, if you'll notice, we have a lot of um, food uh, logos, such as McDonald's, but also Burger King, Wendy's, that sort of thing. They use red and yellow, always. Why do you think red and yellow? We know red is an attention getter, but why that combination? No, um, actually the opposite of red is green, and the opposite of yellow is purple. 
It may, why would it make you hungry? Bread and milk. It looks like ketchup and mustard, and these places sell fries. <laughs> <laughs> they sell hamburgers. You, have you noticed Olive Garden doesn't use red milk? <coughs> they don't sell fries. <laughs> they use green. To remind you of olive oil, you know, something like that. So yeah, if their fast food res restaurants most of the time use red and yellow, and it, ha it has a link to this idea of ketchup and mustard on hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, that sort of thing. So there's ne when you see an advertisement or logo, it's never an accident. They've spent millions of dollars trying to figure out what's going to capture people's attention. If you haven't read the book, uh, Sugar, Fats, or Sugar, Salt, Fat, um, they go into detail about how many scientists they hire to do research on what is going to get people to buy food and continue to buy food. And they study addiction as well. So this is, I mean, they sunk money into this. And the, the more we're aware that every image is very carefully selected, very, very carefully designed, the more we'll be make, make a conscious effort to make a conscious decision about our shopping habits. So this is how, I mean, this is how images relate to us on an everyday basis. So naturally, it's going to relate to other aspects of our lives too. So if you can analyze an advertisement, you can analyze a work of art. It's the same thing. It's just high or low. Andy Warhol was an advertised designer before he became an artist. So, I mean, and he made that connection as well, so. So what do we see here? We're going to practice. What do we see here? Tell me what you see. Hmm? Two guys doing a salute of some kind, right? It's often associated with black power, right? Yeah. So what, what else do you notice? Okay, they're wearing medals. So that would lead us to conclude that it might be the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, they're doing the salute, right? What what else do you see? The background is kind of ambiguous. Yeah, the background's ambiguous. Again, Western art tradition, he didn't like, you know, he the photographer framed it so that the background would be ambiguous. So that you would focus more on individual. They're using different hands. They're using different hands. Interesting. What else? looking down. The guys are looking down. looking audience Right. We have two people looking down. One person not looking down. Yeah, we had a hand up back here. I was going to say the same thing. You're looking down as opposed to looking up at the flag. Right, right. What else do we notice? Yes. Yeah, the guy in the middle is holding something. Right. It's kind of hard to tell what it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Two of them are USA. Yeah, two of them have USA on their jacket. Yeah. What else? So, so different heights. They must be standing on different podiums. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it would lead us to conclude they're different heights. And that, most of us would know the idea that at the Olympics, the different winners stand on different height podiums, right? And so the fact that these guys have different heights leads us to believe that. See, I'm trying to slow you down. You know what I mean? We see them at different heights. When do we see people at different heights? Usually at the Olympics on different podiums, because that's what normally happens. I'm trying to slow you down from, to keep you from automatically leaping to the conclusion, because there's some knowledge here that, that um, I'm going to tell you that some facts about this that might lead you in a different direction. Tommy Smith and John Carlos are these two gentlemen here. And we have Peter Newman. He's an Australian. And he led a push uh, during the 1968 Olympics to, uh, um, for athletes to wear a supportive white badge for human rights. It's a human rights badge. And he convinced Tommy Smith and John Carlos to wear it because uh, he was protesting the Australian um, uh, prejudicial laws that uh, forbade um, 
that were uh, there were a lot of different racist laws within the Australian um, uh, government at the time in the 1960s, and he was protesting also the fact that the head of the International Olympic Committee um, was the same gentleman who had. Uh, allowed the Nazis to do the salute in 1936, and he was being kind of um, doing some questionable <coughs> tactics within the Olympics of 1968, and so this is kind of part of a broader protest. And so he actually asked, so he actually asked the other two wear um, the white badges. So in a way, the three of them are protesting. You would never maybe notice that right off the bat, but it leads you into another direction. So I'll be, I'll be aware that there's something else that maybe you're seeing that connects to something else, which is why you don't necessarily want to automatically jump to conclusions. The other thing is that um, John Carlos forgot his gloves. So Peter Newman said, hey, why don't Tommy, why didn't Tommy give his other glove to him? That way you can both have a glove. So that also was Peter's idea. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that, you'll notice his jacket is open and he's wearing a string of beads. Those beads are African beads to represent the Middle Passage. Um, the other thing is that the three of them became such good friends and they were actually all banned from the 1972 Olympics because of their protests. And when Peter Newman died about four years ago, Tommy Smith and John Carlos were his pallbearers. So that's another thing that you wouldn't necessarily get from just from rushing to a conclusion is the idea that these three, three are very, very good friends. So, so be aware that you can, you can think you know an image, but there are probably pieces of, thing, of information that might change your view of it, even if it's a famous image such as this one which a lot of people might recognize. Okay, does art have to be beautiful? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, this is the tough thing. A lot of times, like if, in, for art history students, if I say, if I say, all right, now we're gonna look at some female nudes. This isn't what you had in mind, right? Because, uh, because of Michelangelo, because of the Renaissance artists, they idealized the human body based on, it really goes back to the Romans, it's all the Romans' fault, it always has been. The Romans and Greeks idealized the human body, they were really idealizing the human body representing gods and goddesses to them who were idealized. But in the Renaissance, people like Michelangelo took that inspiration and idealized the human body in many of their sculptures, especially for divine figures such as Mary and Jesus. How old is Mary supposed to be at this moment? Hmm? How old is her son here? How old is she supposed to be, roughly? Yeah, probably in her 50s. Does she look 50? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what what are we not seeing? Hmm? Yeah, age. It just so happens that Michelangelo's biography was written by a gentleman named Vasari at the time, and he explains to us the virgins don't age. <laughs> <laughs> so there, so, you know, learn something new every day. So, uh, so that's one of so. But a lot of people, when they when I do this workshop for medical school students, I tell that I ask them, "What do you see here?" And usually they say Jesus and Mary. And I say, "Well, how do you know it's Jesus and Mary? It's not labeled." And they say, "Well," and, and we we kind of talk about the fact that you see a, an image formula when you're young, and it gets repeated and repeated and repeated, and then it's automatic. But no one ever says, Mary looks too young. It's only after we've looked at it, and I've asked them for about 20 minutes, what else do you see? And what else do you see? Does someone finally go, yeah, she looks really young. <laughs> because we're not looking for her to look old. We're not looking for those details. And then once you see that, you start to realize that Michelangelo has 
almost complete control over what we think of Jesus and Mary. That's his idea to make her look young. Anyway, there is um, one um, there is one uh, exercise that I want to do. Um, let's see. Normally, let me explain to you. Normally what I have people do in our medical school workshop is I have students, one student get in pairs, and one student looks at an image and then explains to the other student what it is, and the other student has to drive. So guess what you're going to do? Get out your pencil and your paper, and you're going to get with a pair of people, or you're going to get the partner next to you, who's ever next to you. And one person is going to look at the screen, and you're going to look at an artwork very much like, say, this one. It's not going to be something that you normally see. The person drawing, don't look at the screen. Turn sideways or whatever you have to do, but do not look at the screen. The person looking at the screen is going to describe to you what the image is. And I'm only giving you five minutes. So think about the most important qualities you're seeing. Because, okay. all right, take a moment. You're ready.
Thank you, Jordan. That was a wonderful one exercise. Um, so the exercise that Jordan Love has just led us through uh, certainly sharpens our observation and communication skills. And these two skills go hand in hand both in art and in science uh, and medicine. Art and scientific medicine strengthen each other. And although we may not be Leonardo da Vinci's fusing art and science in all that we do, uh, there is creative and analytic thought uh, shared in medicine, especially research, and in artistic expression. Although you were performing in a very severely time-constrained exercise, a museum offers more time to observe and contemplate sculpture and paintings, allowing the works of art time to communicate the artist's intent to you. Even in the museum, as Jordan pointed out, we spend far too little time looking at paintings, and in medicine, far too little time with the patient in our 10 to 15 minute uh, visits. Um, so, far too little on both. So do slow down in both areas. <laughs> William Osler said, but do not get too deeply absorbed in your work to the exclusion of outside interests. Success in life depends much upon the person as on the physician. Mix with your fellow students, mingle with their sports and pleasures. You are to be members of a polite as well as of a liberal profession. And the more you see of life outside the narrow circle of your work, the better equipped you will be for the struggle. So I urge you, take a few minutes, refresh your lives, go see the mural at Old Cowell Hall where you can explore a contemporary version of Mr. Jefferson's version of the polarity of culture and nature, where the original grounds implied a nurture, nurturing within the man-made structures and a release into nature in the Western Blue Ridge. Or take a short walk to the University of Virginia Art Museum, the Fralin, that currently has a new show, the Contemporary Landscape in Western Photography. We also have um, a show on um, a French uh, impressionist painter, Emily Charmy, um, whose image was right next to the nude woman. She was actually a heroin addict. And uh, she was, uh, she's depicted with a syringe in a vial. And, and so it's, it's art that's both beautiful and you know, disturbing at the same time. And contrast the contemporary landscape photography, which is titled Looking at the New West, um, with what you might see in the mural. So, above all, go look. Uh, the visual artist is showing us facts and um, marks that make images. And it's up to you to analyze and reflect and evaluate these facts or marks and images to create a new way of seeing the world for yourself and or of seeing people for many of the room, people in the room here. Um, it's your patience that you want to see in a new life. So thank you. And thank you. For Thank you both, and I hope uh, all of you are not too, um, your minds aren't too boggled uh, by the drawing exercise and the, the communication challenges uh, that you experienced. But we have time for a few questions and comments from you. Um, again, what you saw, what you experienced was a portion of the full two and a half hour uh, interactive workshop that Jordan has designed. Um, yes. Question yeah. to you. I'm sorry. Right, right the top. Okay. No, I'm here. Okay. Here. Go ahead with that one. Hi, my name is Ivan Logan. I'm in the neurology department, and I want to thank you for a very exciting presentation. I would like to share uh, two other elements to your analysis that have to do with the physiology of the brain that might offer an, another alternative explanation for the selective observation, and it gets to both the selective observation and your other comment about slowing down. So the brain has two ways to make your eyes move. One way 
is called saccadic eye movements, which is where you jump from here to here. And the other way is called smooth pursuits, where you follow a target. Now, the brain can only voluntarily generate a saccadic eye movement. It cannot generate a smooth pursuit. That can only follow a moving target. And the interesting thing that I would point out here is that when the brain generates a saccadic movement from here to here, the afferent visual input to the brain is shut off. So if you look from the left to the right and someone sticks a target up quickly in the middle, it will be invisible. And so as we're looking at all of those white-shirted people jumping from this one to that one to this one to that one, it's entirely possible that the gorilla could be invisible just because of that physiological principle. That's, that's interesting. It would be interesting to see, to see how that works, especially considering that half, pe half of the population does see the gorilla. So how is there, it's inter it would be interesting to see whether there's a difference in the way that their eyes dart, exactly or the way right. that their mind processes the, the darting, um, the base, and, and whether that affects the, their ability to see the gorilla. And the interesting thing that I noticed when I first took that, that test, I did see the gorilla, but here's the key, I didn't remember the gorilla stopping and beating his chest. I remember seeing him, but I don't remember the action. And so that what, that's what blew my mind. I was like, oh, I saw the gorilla. And then I was like, wait, he beat his chest? I didn't see that. So it, it would be interesting to see what people remember, and if they do see the gorilla, what they remember the gorilla doing. Because, I mean, that would be a really fascinating thing to, to yeah, study. And, and that gets back to your idea about moving slowly, because if you're moving slowly, you're moving physiologically more towards the idea of smooth pursuit where all the background is, is uh, entrained into the brain, as opposed to saccadic movements where the brain shuts off all the stuff in the middle. That would be fantastic, yeah. Okay. Uh, I am Abhishek, a resident physician in the Department of Psychiatry. First of all, I would like to thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, what my question was is, uh, I found that, uh, I mean, especially the demonstration of the picture, like communicating the message was a was really a tough challenge. So I think that if if we go through these exercises, maybe we'll be able to uh, improve communication in general, improve communication in the hospital too. So I was just wondering, uh, like still I'm in the training stage. So how to use this to improve the communication, like improve the clinical communication? Or since I'm also in the department of psychiatry, so mm -hmm. how to kind of use use this art to help improve the communication and understand the kind of patient better? Well, they, they find that the more you you know like anything, practice, practice, practice. The more you do it, the it, the more you have to communicate, even if you're using art historical terms instead of terms specific to your field, the more you have to go through the act of doing it, the better you get, like anything. And so when you, but with visual analysis and using art historical terms, when you have to talk about things like relative scale or relative size, that's applicable to a lot of different fields, especially um, in medicine where you're talking about different sizes of anything from tumors to swelling to, you know, and you're, we often talk about relative color, we talk about uh, placement, we talk about uh, behavior of the figures that we see in art, in much the same way that you describe behaviors in people, in patients. So it really gets to, um, with art, it's really about observing similar things, but also just practice your practice shift practice, where you don't have, especially with art, you don't have any sort of medical hierarchy that you have to worry about, like, oh, well, you know, a lot of people want to defer to their senior uh, physician. In, in art, it's a level playing field. So you learn to take what everybody says with equal weight. And when you practice that, you tend to take it with you. So that's how sometimes the art communication really helps. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions, like any practical suggestions, how to do that, like how to practice and? Um, you know, sometimes it just helps, like um, from a student level, just to um, have a partner and practice describing what you're, you could do the drawing exercise with medical images. 
not asking the person to describe it, but or, or to draw it, I mean, but you could have a partner look at an image, describe it to them, and then when they look at it, they could say whether or not it resembled what they had in their head. You know, when you when you practice that sort of thing, and when you need to practice using vocabulary to describe whether it could be color, size, location, spatial location, um, behavior, whether it's emotion, sadness, um, body language, when you practice talking about, and this is where art helps come in, because especially with photography, you're talking about looking at photographs where a person is acting sad or acting suspicious or acting in a certain way, and you have to describe that to another person, you get better and better at it. So one place you could practice is also at the art museum. Yeah. <laughs> so come which on be, Which would be lovely. Yeah. Um, I, I would also like to mention that for medical students in the audience, there will be an opportunity to do the entire workshop on November the 19th. There are some flyers uh, up in the back. We only have room for 20 uh, students, so it's going to be first come, first served. Um, also, I'd like to invite you to come back. Uh, next week, we have a program uh, called Freeing Patients BRCA Data. This is genetic data uh, related to breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, we'll have with us Joanna Rudnick, whose documentary In the Family about being BRCA positive will be shown uh, in, as part of the Virginia Film Festival on Thursday, November 7th. Uh, Joanna Rudnick will be joined in the Medical Center Hour on the 6th by Mimi Foster Riley from the School of Law and Susan Modisett from the Department of OBGYN here at UVA. So we will see you then. Thank you so much.